Um, today's the 24th class, I believe, of our 32 classes of our structured study of Vipassana introspective insight into the three marks of existence. The uh, three marks of existence are Anicca, Anatta, and Dukkha. Anicca refers to the impermanence of all things. Anatta refers to a uh, misunderstood uh, view of self, a fabricated view of self. And the third mark of existence is the stress and suffering or dukkha that is the result of the misunderstanding of the relationship between the two. It doesn't mean that the, that the first two do not exist. The Buddha never taught nothingness or emptiness as anything useful except to be empty of ignorance. That is a, uh, a destination or a repository for a fabricated soul. Um, we started out our study um, with a, a, a two-week introduction, a, a, a background to uh, really everything that the Buddha taught, uh, because it does focus on this. Then we looked at dependent origination uh, and an analysis of the Four Noble Truths in the Eightfold Path to establish the context for everything that's followed from that. Uh, and over the weeks, we we were getting more and more focused on where the Dhamma resolves, which is within each and every individual, not something external has nothing to do with gods or divas or chanting or rituals of any kind. The Buddha's Dhamma resolves within each and every human being. It's a human Dhamma. Uh, then we looked at the Buddha's uh, description of Dukkha in three suttas that all basically taught the same thing from uh, slightly different uh, viewpoints, uh, where the Buddha is teaching that Dukkha can be resolved basically to two uh, issues. One is the constant need for sensory indulgence, and this relates directly to jhana, but also in general uh, to the dhamma. Let me explain that before I go to the second one. Um, the constant need for sensory indulgence is experienced in meditation as boredom, but boredom so extreme that an adult human being cannot sit quietly anymore. In other words, they have to address the need for their distraction immediately. We can no longer meditate. The Buddha teaches when that happens, he doesn't use these words, I will, to grow up and take a breath. Because the essence of awakening, as a Buddha describes awakening, is a fully mature human being, meaning a human being who is comfortable with who they are because they understand who they are. That all makes sense, doesn't it? That's, a, that's an aspect of, a, of a, a, a mature human being. We simply understand who we are in the world we're living in. That's what the Buddha taught. He understood that the, the problem of stress and suffering resolves that's not the right word. The problem of stress and suffering resolves in the individual because that's where it originates in, in a fabricated view of reality. We learned in dependent origination what the Buddha awakened to is that it is ignorance of four noble truths that leads to fabri a fabricated view of self in relation to the world and leads to all manner of confusion, delusion, ongoing stress and suffering, ongoing disappointing experiences all rooted in wrong views or views ignorant of Four Noble Truths. And that distraction that we just talked about a few moments ago is experienced in meditation because in that moment, I need to be eye-making. I need to be contributing something to this. I need to keep adding something to this. This needs more. Um, that constant need for sensory indulgence is the underlying problem of each and every human being that carries around that need in this moment for more distraction. Again, I'm emphasizing the point from slightly different uh, perspectives to show why the Buddha taught this single meditation method. The, now remember, uh, some of you are new, but the Buddha spent many years, six years, after leaving his father's palace and prior to his awakening, where he studied with all the uh, spiritual, so-called spiritual teachers of his time, all teaching variations uh, rooted in the Vedas and the Upanishads, the precursor, uh, the doctrinal precursor to modern Hinduism. The Buddha studied all of those doctrines and all of those meditation methods and dismissed them out of hand as not leading to the goal. He dismissed them as they were simply more distractions. And that whole experience framed why he taught the Dhamma in the way that he taught. And so he immediately realized the problem of a mind rooted in ignorance is constantly seeking that distraction through sensory indulgence. And so the foundational counter to that 
would be a well-concentrated mind, a mind that is not constantly driven to satisfy its own fabricated needs. Quite an introduction to get down to this one point. And so the Buddha taught jhana meditation and no other method. I've read probably 80% of the Sutta Pitaka, which is a lot. It's, it's a huge volume in the, in the Pali Canon. And I have never, ever once in thousands and thousands of words and literally thousands of suttas ever heard the Buddha reference any other type of meditation. Every time he mentions meditation, he calls it jhana. And he described the how to engage in meditation practice is go find the root of a tree or an empty hut and do jhana, meaning do concentration. And when you understand the overarching focus and context of the Buddha's Dhamma, a concentration practice simply makes sense. There's no reason to do anything else because you're going to fall into fabricated views of what meditation should be, could be, would be, what I want it to be. I'd rather be chanting. I'd rather be doing this. I'd rather be doing that. And I'll call it meditation. I'd rather go take a walk on the towpath. I'll call that meditation. It's, it's remarkable to me how many, how, how, how craving and clinging has led to the development of many meditation practices, meaning we want it to be anything other than a concentration practice. And that's why we reject jhana meditation. Not, we don't, not everybody, but some people reject jhana meditation because it's simply easier and more distracting to do something else. Okay. So um, we're resolved on this issue of jhana. The last few weeks we looked at fabrications and um, independent origination, it states from ignorance of four noble truths as a requisite condition come fabrications. And from those fabricated views, all manner of confusion, delusion, and stress and suffering arises. So the issue is to resolve our recognition of fabricated views as fabricated views and simply abandon it. How do we do it? We do it within a, with a concentration practice, deepening our own concentration, and then a broader framework to recognize what exactly is a fabrication. Because if you think about this, this brilliant man and his teaching, how would a mind that's rooted in fabrication, rooted in basically lies that it's told itself, <clears throat> rooted in ignorance of the way things truly are, how would that mind recognize fabrications and ignorance? It wouldn't. How would a mind that is deluded about who it is in relation to the world recognize its delusion? It's impossible. It can't be done. It's the nature of ignorance to create very powerful strat strategies to ignore that ignorance, including so-called spiritual practices. And it's a nature of a mind rooted in delusion to create objects in its life that affirm the delusion rather than recognize it, even no matter how much stress and suffering follows from that fabricated view. And the Buddha realized this. And after his awakening, he sat off and on in meditation now, thinking, is there a way that I can teach this that will pierce that common veil of human ignorance? How do I get past it? And he developed an eightfold path specifically for this purpose, to overcome our own ignorance, to provide the framework for recognizing fabrications. And so the last few weeks, we, we had suttas on fabrications. Uh, last week's sutta, the uh, Saraputta Sutta, Saraputta concludes that, his, describing his understanding and the benefit of understanding fabrications as just this, I now understand the nature of all impermanence, the arising and passing away of all impermanence. So there's no longer a distraction caused by that or a clinging caused by that. And then he concludes this most powerful sutta by saying, I now understand and have abandoned all wrong views all views ignorant of Four Noble Truths. This is the Buddha's, you could call him the second in command. This is how the Sariputta is describing his awakening. Ultimately, the, the conclusion of his awakening is recognizing and abandoning all of his own wrong views, not views that some, um, some external force established as a wrong view. And he was never taught to just be positive in your thinking, just think loving thoughts. <clears throat> when you think about that, a mind that, that cannot think loving thoughts 100% of the time, which is most human beings, the cruelest thing you can do is to put into that mind that you better be loving all the time or there's something wrong with you. The Buddha recognized that. That kind of pseudo positive thinking was common during the Buddha's time, just as common as it is today. And the Buddha realized the cruelty of telling another human being you should act a certain way when he understood they couldn't act a certain way. 
not all the time. Why? Because their minds were, were rooted in, in fabrications and rooted in ignorance. So this most compassionate man, understanding that, taught a very gentle Dhamma for each and every human being to develop the ability to recognize and abandon their own fabricated views. And it's rooted in jhana. It's rooted in a, a meditation practice that deepens concentration. Now, again, jhana refers to four levels or ever deepening levels of meditative absorption that each and every uh, jhana meditator experiences uh, in every meditation session, at least the first three. And you'll understand that a little bit more as I go through it. It's, it there's nothing... Um, there's nothing uncommon or extraordinary about these ever deepening levels of jhana. The Buddha teaches it, teaches these levels of jhana, uh, simply as to recognize that our meditation method is actually bearing fruit. We're actually deepening our concentration. That's the only value in this. Um, when I was first uh, bouncing around in modern Buddhism and, and grasping after just about every teaching out there, the few times that jhana was mentioned, it was always presented to me as Jhana is something for super advanced, extraordinary meditators that have been meditating for many, many lifetimes. And basically what they're telling me is, this is what the Buddha taught as the culmination of the goal, but you're not capable of doing it. Again, an incredibly cruel teaching that the Buddha never taught. But I bought into it because respected teachers were telling me this, that I can never, this is what an awakened human being, this is how they meditate. You can't do it, but there's a teaching. And I just accepted it. Well, there's something, you know, there's something lacking in me. I'll never achieve that type of med What kind of practice is that to teach anybody? A better practice, a more loving message would be, if that's the message, is just don't bother. Go bowling or, or smoke a joint for all the benefit you're going to have out of it because you can't do it. But yet I did it because I was associated with a group and I, and I had a certain amount of respect for this person, so I followed them. And that's, that's the nature of fabrications. Once we decide that we're something, we're gonna keep doing it until we can no longer stand doing it anymore. Unfortunately, that usually applies to jhana meditation unless we understand why we're doing it. So here's the, here's the sutta. On one occasion, the Buddha addressed those gathered. I tell you, friends, that the ending of the defilements of greed, aversion, and deluded thinking the three defilements are what we're addressing in the Buddha's Dhamma. At, at, at first, it might seem almost insignificant, but all human difficulty can be seen as rooted in greed aversion and ongoing deluded thinking. <clears throat> Let's start again. I tell you, friends, that the ending of the defilements of greed, aversion, and deluded thinking de <clears throat> depends on fully developing the four levels of jhana and overcoming the desire for establishment in the dimension of uh, in the dimension of the infinitude of space, one of the things, and again for the new folks, you've heard me talk about this often. Um, a common underlying theme of the uh, theme of the entire Buddha's Dhamma is the Buddha teaching what his Dhamma is and what it addresses, and as important and as often that he addressed this, what his Dhamma isn't and what should be recognized as as not to be developed, meaning any type type of speculative suppositional. Uh, self-establishment in some non-physical realm, which is a lot of what spirituality and a lot of what modern Buddhism is about, is achieving a, a non-physical goal of the Dhamma, meaning the establishment of a self or a soul in something other than as a human being. The Buddha rejected that out of hand and recognizing the cruelty of that type of teaching because what he wanted to teach and what he understood is that each and every human being can have an incredibly meaningful and peaceful life if they understand who they are in relation to the world. And that's what he wanted to teach, how to have a human life as a human being, because that's what we are. He taught nothing that could not be experienced right here, right now, with a mind united in its body. And that uniting the mind in the, and its body begins with concentration. That's the essence of concentration, isn't it? being in my body without any distraction. So the Buddha is cautioning here because it was common during his time and just as common during our time to see a spiritual or religious practice as an, not, I was gonna use the word attempt. The focus of that is to escape a human life and establish yourself in some non-physical form. The, the largest form of modern Buddhism, and think about this, after 2,600 years, and by far, is uh, Pure Land Buddhism, and there's different variants on that, 
and Pure Land Buddhism, and I'm, very, I'm greatly simplifying it, so please hold the email, but Pure Land or Nigerian Buddhism um, ultimately resolves in a chant. And the teaching is that if you keep this chant on your lips, moment by moment throughout your life, and most importantly, if it's on your lips or in your mind when you die, you'll instantly be taken to Amitabha Buddha heaven, where you'll be taken care of by Amitabha Buddha forever and ever and ever. It sounds great. It sounds wonderful. I tried it for about eight minutes. It's simply not, and, it, I, I, and I only stopped because it didn't seem right to me. What I realized also when I started studying what the Buddha actually taught is he never taught anything about that. And you think about the motivation for in this moment, I'm not good enough. So I'm going to adopt something that affirms that I'm no good, but I can be good in a future life or in some type of, of suppositional mental establishment right here and right now. Again, how cruel could that teach you, could any teaching be to say you're simply not good enough because that reaffirms our own belief in ourselves, isn't it? The reason why we start grasping after and clinging to ultimately fabricated views is because we think we need more to be happy, peaceful, safe, and secure, that we're not good enough as we are. The Buddha said that's, that's completely ridiculous because you can't be anything more than what you are. How can we be? It's the ultimate practical teaching. Remember in the Datu Vibhanga Sutta, the Buddha teaches that each and every human being is made up of six properties and only six properties, no matter what they do. And think of when I tell you what the six properties are, see if you can find a way to attach something to these properties that's <coughs> permanent and meaningful and describes itself. The six properties are the four elements, earth, wind, fire, and water. The space property, there needs to be a space property for those four elements to manifest in. And the sixth property of consciousness. Now, if that sixth property, consciousness meaning ongoing thinking, and we're not talking about a grand cosmic consciousness, one, this one mind consciousness fabrication, simply ongoing thinking rooted in ignorance of four noble truths. If that's the interpretive vehicle for these other five elements, and that interpretive vehicle is rooted in ignorance, what's it going to be interpreted in relation to these elements? It, it's going to be an ignorant translation or interpretation. The Buddha taught to understand who the self is in relation to those objects and events, views and ideas, so that we can remain at peace through understanding. If we truly understand the how and why of something, we won't react to it. And we won't want it to be any different than it is. Most importantly, when we understand who we are, we'll stop reacting and insisting that I be different than I am. Let me continue. So all those levels of uh, speculative suppositional existences are all things that the Buddha said don't do. So this fully, de fully developing the four levels of jhana and overcoming the desire for establishment in the, in the dimension of the infinitude of space, the dimension of the infinitude of consciousness, the dimension of nothing or the dimension of perception or non-perception or the dimension of emptiness. And the Buddha occasionally used slightly different terms but what he's saying is don't establish yourself in your imagination ever, ever. That's, that's the ultimate problem for human beings is we live in a fabricated or imagined view of ourself in relation to a fabricated and imagined view of the world. Notice that the Buddha didn't say that the self doesn't exist and the world doesn't exist, which is the only way that a fabricated Dharma could resolve because it doesn't fit any other way. The Buddha says we exist, but we only exist right here and right now. And the only experience that you can have as a human being of a human life is to be present for that life. Makes sense, doesn't it? But if we're stuck in a fabricated view, our mind isn't in our body in a fabricated view. It has to be either in the past or in the future and never right here and right now. And that's the problem. It's always stressful. We, 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 we've gone through several suttas where the Buddha says, if, an, if it's impermanent, what is it? It's stressful. And if it's impermanent, can it be a self? Can it be a self? No, how could it be? The Buddha continues, friends, the ending of the defilements de depends on the first jhana. Right? This is the description of this first level of meditation. The first jhana is described as secluded from sensuality and other unskillful mental qualities. One enters and remains in the first jhana. This first jhana is experienced as rapture born of that very seclusion. It is accompanied by directed thought and evaluation. So, in our meditation method, excuse me. In jhana meditation, 
this simple method of deepening concentration begins with establishing seclusion. The Buddha's instructions, go find the root of a tree or an empty hut, meaning go move, remove yourself from your entanglements in the world for just a few minutes and sit quietly without any distraction. And he always said that. He never said, go find a quiet path and walk or go, find a, go, go in a corner of a room and chant or do a thousand bows or pray to deities. He never said any of these things. And again, I'm not, if people that do that, that's fine. The, the important point is to remember that it's simply not what a Buddha taught, and it's not wise to incorporate these into a Dhamma practice. Doesn't mean we can't do it. If you feel, if you like to chant or visualize or anything else, that's fine. Just remember that it's not Dhamma practice, not something that a Buddha taught. And so if we start incorporating other practices as our Dhamma practice, it's simply gonna distract away from the Dhamma practice. But it doesn't mean we shouldn't have other interests. Just keep the focus on the Dhamma. Um, and accompanied by directed thought and evaluation. So we begin our meditation practice. We leave the world behind. We find our quiet place. If, we, we, if we're lucky enough to have a room, we go into that room or at least a corner of a room. Let me just touch on that a little bit. It's best to have one place that we meditate in, whether it's, if we can dedicate a room to that, that's great. Most of us can't, but set up, set up a corner of a room that you know is going to be quiet or mostly quiet and make that be your meditation spot. The consistency in meditation is important too. Let me get back to this. And this first minute, this first level of jhana, and as soon as I take a breath, my mind is going to be distracted towards something, usually the events of the day or where I'm going tomorrow or any of that. In that moment, I direct my thought back to my breath. In the instructions you'll hear, directed thought, and there's a little bit deeper explanation that I won't get into, but it's not that important. It simply means in this beginning of meditation, I recognize I'm caught up in my thinking. I come back to my breath, my in-breath and my out-breath. And usually in that first level of jhana, particularly for new, um, excuse me, new meditators, um, we're naturally going to be thinking, am I doing this right? This is too hard. Is this what that bold guy said? <laughs> we'll be judging or evaluating our meditation and that's normal. What do we do when we, when we find ourselves judging our meditation method in some way? Go back to our breathing. There's no analysis, there's no, there's no thinking about in meditation except our breath. So the first level of jhana is simply to recognize I'm still involved in directed thought. Let me direct that thought to my breath. I can't do this. This is just too hard. That's evaluation. Or I can't believe any of this. This is just nonsense. Get up off your cushion. What, no matter what that thought is, and even if the thought is, I can't sit here another minute. You take a breath. And if you keep coming back to, I can't sit here for another minute, agree with it. Get up off your cushion and start again when it's just too difficult. And for beginning meditators, I always suggest start with short periods of meditation, two, three, four, five minutes, and gradually add time. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. In meditation, no matter what we find, as we begin our meditation, we simply come back to our breath. And in the beginning, it will be directed thought and evaluation. It's the first John. Has everybody experienced that first jhana? Mm -hmm. yeah. Those that are just joining us today, you're excluded from. The Buddha continues. Furthermore, the ending of the defilements depends on the second jhana, which is the stilling of directed thought and evaluation. This second jhana is experienced as rapture and pleasure born of concentration. Excuse me. Free of directed thought and evaluation. The joy of concentration permeates their entire mind and body. Has everyone had a momentary experience of the joy of concentration permeating your entire mind and body? Yes. yes. Yeah. And that's the second jhana. The reason why I'm saying that is it's important to recognize it. And again, I've never read anything in the Buddhist teaching where he says that you must experience that for eight seconds, eight minutes, eight years. He teaches it just to recognize that that's an aspect of ever deepening concentration. And we speak of rapture and joy. In this sense, rapture simply means joyful engagement with the Dhamma. 
and notice the the deepening concentration here first our rapture our joy with what we're doing is born of that very seclusion and there's a we should see that as taking refuge i won't talk too much about the Ratana sutta but our meditation methods method is a true refuge from the world at least for those few minutes when we're sitting in seclusion and there's there's it's skillful to 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 generate a joyful enthusiasm for that those of us that have been meditating for a, a fair amount of time feel that draw at least at times don't you that you're looking forward to getting back to your cushion there's an aspect of that joyful engagement in there when you finally get there, isn't it? That's what that, that's what this means. There's nothing, what I'm saying is there's nothing extraordinary even about these deeper levels, ever deepening levels of jhana. It's simply an acknowledgement of this is wonderful. And isn't it? Those of us that have developed meditation, jhana meditation, recognize that as a truthful statement, isn't it? That it's wonderful. Just to have that experience. We often jokingly say it's that alone is worth the price of admission. Forget about all the rest of the benefits. Just being able to, to develop that level of, of control of our own minds, that we can have that joyful experience of simply being present with myself. In that moment, in that moment of joyful engagement in the concentration, we are ourselves. That's what it feels like to be a self, to be a, a, a fully mature human being. In that moment, it may not last, but this is another reason why jhana meditation is so important because we're teaching ourselves first in an abstract way what it means to be a human being and then in a direct experiential way. That's what it means to be a human being, no matter what whether standing, walking, sitting, or lying down, that's a human being at peace, no matter what's occurring. And isn't that worth the price of admission? That's what the Buddha's Dhamma teaches. No matter what, when we let go of all fabricated views, all views ignorant of who I am in relation to the world I'm living in, this is the result. It's worth the price of admission, isn't it? That being said, I think I'm going to raise the price of admission. <laughs> the boot, that's not it yet. Though. There's still more. <laughs> I'm just skipping over some comments. The Buddha continues. Furthermore, the ending of the defilements depends on the third jhana. The Buddha is saying the ending of all human misery depends on these jhanas, depends on deepening our concentration. Furthermore, the ending of the defilements depends on the third jhana, which is the fading of rapture. So a, a mind that's clinging to a certain feeling is going to have great difficulty with the fading of rapture, of joyful engagement. But a mind well concentrated understands, I'm just deepening my concentration. And there's no grasping after or clinging to it. It's simply an aspect of ever deepening concentration. There's nothing else to do. They remain equanimous, mindful, alert, sensitive to pleasure, meaning not grasping after. There's a difference between sensual indulgence and sensitive to pleasure. Sensitive in this sense, in the context of the Buddha's Dhamma, simply means a well-focused, well-concentrated mindfulness of pleasure, meaning we experience it. And this leads to, or answers the question that often arises with newcomers. When I let go of all views of self, What's going to happen to me? How am I going to even know I'm living life? Because we'll be sensitive to it, not grasping after it. There's a, there's a, it's, it, it, it's not significantly different. It's completely different. I'm not grasping after anything in this moment when I'm sensitive to what's occurring. I'm simply sensitive to what's occurring. I'm using my sixth sense base the way it's intended as a fully mature, awakened human being, simply to interact with the external world the people and events of my life without reacting or being distracted by them. I maintain that peace and calm no matter what. And this jhana is now the beginning of the experience of what it means to be an awakened, fully mature human being. With the fading of rapture, this pleasant abiding permeates the entire mind and body. Has anyone had that experience even momentarily of having that feeling permeate your entire body? Yes. yes. Yeah. Again, there's nothing extraordinary about this third jhana, despite how it was presented to me for many years. 
This is simply an aspect of ordinary right meditation. And the reason why I'm kind of emphasizing this point, and maybe it comes from my own past experience, is how meditation is presented as after the beginning, meditation is often for only advanced folks or something. It doesn't, it, it's hard to explain because it, now it doesn't make sense to me. There's nothing, there's no levels of, there's no systems of advanced meditation. There's only, according to Buddha, there's only jhana meditation. And the only reason we're teaching jhana in this way, these four levels of meditative absorption, is so we recognize ever deepening levels of concentration and what it feels like. So this third level of concentration feels like this peace and equanimity is now permeating my entire being. And so as we continue to integrate the Eightfold Path off our cushion, that's our experience of our life. Does everybody get that? Again, just to make the point that I made earlier, jhana meditation is both metaphor and the practical experience of what it means to be awakened. And it's when you understand that in the, in the context of the Eightfold Path, the, the brilliance of Siddhartha Gautama comes through. He, he taught this most basic way of living. Think about it. Human beings can't live without their breath, can we? At all. I mean, you, you, what do you, you get a couple seconds if you hold your breath? And yet here it is. It's the, it's the one thing that the Buddha connected with to, to truly give us a human life by connecting with the one thing that we that gives us that life, isn't it? There's an interesting aspect about this too, and, I, and this is my own conjecture and supposition. But you know when you're stressed out, if you remember to take a breath, forget the Dhamma, you feel better, don't you? The Buddha recounts the development of jhana meditation, thinking about something that happened to him when he was a five-year-old boy. And I think he, he could remember that because of his well-concentrated mind. It's not, it's not to say that we don't remember things that happened to us when we were five, if we don't have a well-concentrated mind, but the nature of it. Siddhartha was a prince in his father's kingdom. His father gave him everything that he could think of to keep young Siddhartha enamored with the palace life so he would never leave. And even then, young Siddhartha was disappointed in his life. And he wanted more. And he felt bad about that wanting more and confused about that wanting more and would often get himself frustrated. And 26 years, at, at the age of 35, seeking understanding and frustrated about which way he should go. Now, this is just before his awakening putting in all this time and all these different meditation methods and trying to figure out which, which direction should I go in. I've done all these things. I've studied with the great masters and nothing's worked. What should I do now? And he remembered this time when he was five years old, very frustrated and angry with himself in the world. And he sat down under a tree and just became mindful of his breath. And he remembered that 30 years later as what he needed to do. And so he sat in that meditation method the legend is that he sat there for maybe 40 days. It doesn't really matter. The time frame isn't important. But using this simple method, young Siddhartha was able to unite his mind and his body and finally see things clearly. And as we learned in the Nagara Sutta, he, he confronted this circular reasoning of self-referential views stuck in that need for constant sensual desire, stuck in ignorance that wouldn't allow him to escape that that conditioned thinking unless he had a way of seeing it clearly and that's why he taught what he taught and that again that's why he taught jhana meditation and nothing else furthermore the ending of the defilements depends on the fourth jhana which is the abandoning of evaluation meaning there's no longer evaluation simply means i'm judging anything about my practice it's good bad it feels this way or that way i'm doing it right i'm not doing it right all of that falls away they enter and remain in the fourth jhana, which is pure equanimity. Equanimity means, simply means a balanced mind. There's nothing, th this mind is simply resting in peace, which is pure equanimity and mindful. Fusion. Being pure, neither pleasure nor pain is seen. 
being pure, neither pleasure nor pain is seen. From the minute we're born, we become preoccupied with pleasure and pain, don't we? In fact, the Buddha could almost has, have accurately described the first noble truth as there is dukkha, as saying there is preoccupation with dukkha, because it is that constant preoccupation with what's giving me pleasure in this moment and what might take away from that pleasure that is distracting me from being mindful in my body in this moment. I'm either in the past or the future. I'm stuck in a fabricated view of what I need to be happy rather than simply be present with life as life occurs. They sit permeated in mind and body with pure bright awareness. The fourth jhana is a pleasant abiding. It's also what, how the Buddha describes an awakened human being is resting in that pleasant abiding. This follower of the noble eightfold path understands that any phenomena connected to five clinging aggregates, the five clinging aggregates are form, feeling, perceptions, mental fabrications, and consciousness. Now remember, it's, it's consciousness with a small c, simply ongoing thinking rooted in ignorance of four noble truths. The five clinging aggregates is simply the, um, the phrase that Buddha used to describe the ongoing personal experience of suffering. There's nothing, it, it's, a, um, it's initially an abstract term because most of us, and none of us have heard it until we come to the, to the Dhamma, but it simply describes a human being in a physical body whose mind is rooted in ignorance. And so the, the second aggregate of the five aggregates, a perception. So now I'm in this body, but I don't understand who I am in relation to the world and even in relation to my own body. And I can't help then but perform a perception that is rooted in ignorance about what's occurring to that form. And from that perception, I create thought constructs or, or deepening fabrications, the third aggregate, <clears throat> which ultimately affects the ongoing, my ongoing thinking. And the five clinging aggregates, when you look at it that way, describes the feedback loop that we're all caught in, doesn't it? Because it's all occurring within this form. But it's also where the Dhamma resolves within the five clinging aggregates. This is what we started with 24 classes ago. And now we're seeing where the Dhamma resolves. It's right here. It's right at this point of five clinging aggregates. <clears throat> These five clinging aggregates are impermanent, stressful. They're a disease. They're painful. They're an affliction. And as such, they cannot be a self. I won't, I won't get into that teaching. But the Buddha says, if it's experiencing stress and suffering or impermanence at all, in any way, it cannot be a self. And I'm not going to get into that. That's, in fact, it really can't be explained. It's to be experienced, though, and it can be experienced. This follower of the Noble Eightfold Path disregards those phenomena, meaning anything that's fabricated or speculated, and inclines their mind to the cessation of ignorance. Nothing remains to provoke the birth of suffering. That's the true meaning of the Buddha's of the Buddhist teachings on karma and rebirth. It has nothing to do with a future physical birth. It has everything to do with what am I holding in mind? What is my level of mindfulness right now? And what will that give birth to in this moment? And if in this moment I'm holding in mind, I'm mindful of ignorant views, it just makes sense that this next moment I can only give birth to another moment rooted in that same ignorance. If in this moment my mind is rooted in the wisdom of an eightfold path, then in this moment, I can give birth to another moment that is rooted in that wisdom and so incline my minds to awakening. Does everybody understand that last? Yeah. And that's the, where the Buddha's Dhamma resolves. Each moment holds the potential to either continue ignorance or to develop a common peaceful mind and awakening each and every moment. And that depends on <clears throat> what we're holding in mind. That's why the Buddha taught an eightfold path. As we integrate the eightfold path, then the eightfold path is governing our experience of what's occurring right here and right now. I'm gonna to have to start getting a, a bright or a neon thing. I can't see it. It's too far. <laughs> I just gotta get, I gotta get some, somebody with, that can hold that with a fan here. <laughs> um, where was I? <laughs> uh, in your fabrication, that's where you were. Oh, so yeah, like in a fabricated view. And so, Getting back to the uh, jhana meditation as both a metaphor and a practical experience of awakening, 
do you see that this is where it resolves in this in this fourth level of jhana, letting go of all those fabricated views and the grasping after nothingness and emptiness and any other um, positive thinking concept, which is simply another cruel judgment on myself that I need something positive in order to live in the world. I just need to be myself to have a positive experience. It, it resolves here because we can feel it here. And I'm using feeling in a very broad sense in this fourth level of jhana pure equanimity, the pleasant abiding. Has everybody experienced that even just for a moment? Yes, no? Everybody? Yeah. I know you, I'm not gonna listen to you. <laughs> even just for a moment? You would have done, it's just like that. Yeah. Yeah, well, it went so fast. I'm not trying to convince you. No. That is, that is, and it's very similar to the third genre, which you can't argue about. That is, that, that's what it feels like to be an awakened human being. In our meditation, we can have that experience of it. And then the Eightfold Path gives us the ability and the framework and the structure to get off our cushion, re-enter the world while still remaining secluded. Lorna described this. Can you wanna, do you wanna explain that? All right, and if you can say no, if, you, if you'd rather not. Because you described it so beautifully that one. A few times. Which one? <laughs> but that about about the seclusion you establish on your cushion, you're able to take off your cushion. Um, yeah, sort of. Um, well, he does refer to it as the cloak, doesn't it? The yes. The Buddha. Um, you develop a feeling of a cloak sitting <laughs> sitting under a cloak when you're on the cushion not attached to a phenomena it's the detachment from phenomena that makes you feel um released released relaxed whatever whatever um and you once you see that sort of on your cushion and you feel that and understand that then you can see how getting caught up in phenomena um is is stressful and I can sometimes feel the cloak even though I'm doing going about my normal you know normal things <coughs> in life I feel detached from phenomena but in a in the right way not it not in a detached way when you're detached and not concentrating or not not with it or you know you're dizzy in your head or something that's also a detachment it's not like that it's it's a understanding that you just you have the option of not getting involved with phenomena so would you describe that as as yeah you got you're not describing being detached from it you're simply at peace with phenomena you don't need it to be any different than what's occurring it's true yeah. yeah. And that's what the, that's what a fully mature human being would act like, wouldn't you? Yeah. And so no matter what the phenomena is, in our meditation, we learn to l simply be focused on what's occurring, not necessarily the focus isn't detaching from phenomena. It's, it's more of a, a direction towards simply being mindful of what's occurring. Mm -hmm. So on my cushion, I put aside <clears throat> the, the, the issues I might have at work tomorrow and the Maserati I'm getting tomorrow morning and, and uh, that my, no, my neighbor drove over my daffodils again, all of that is left aside. And I deepen it, deepen my concentration on my cushion and then off my cushion, when my neighbor drives over my daffodils again, I don't lose my mind. And I simply address the issue. Please stop driving over my daffodils rather than please stop driving over my daffodils. It simply changes the immediate experience of our life. We maintain the seclusion that we establish on our cushion, off our cushion, mm -hmm. through the framework of the Eightfold Path. It's not, we, it's not just meditation again, remember that. The follower of the Noble Eightfold Path, from fully developing the four levels of jhana, knows an exquisite peace from fully developing the four levels of jhana. We know an exquisite peace. 
<clears throat> fabrications ended, meaning all false views of self in relation to the world, rooted in ignorance of four, four noble truths, have ended. Grasping to. This fashion and unbinding is established. <clears throat> it is as if an archer or their apprentice were to practice <clears throat> on a particular target. <clears throat> With continued practice, they would be able to shoot quickly for long distances, piercing many targets. In the same manner, they reach this, the cessation of defilements. If not then, through continued joyful right effort and cessation of the five lower fetters of self-identification, um, of grasping at rituals and practices, doubt and uncertainty, uncertainty sensual craving, and sensual craving is including the craving for a non-physical existence, uh, and deluded thinking, which is part of that too. They are released, they're unbound, meaning unbound from views ignorant of four noble truths. I tell you, friends, that the ending of the defilements of greed, aversion, and deluded thinking depends on fully developing the four levels of jhana and overcoming the desire for establishment in, a, in any non, any fabricated dimension. I'm not going to read every one of them. All of the, any, any fabricated dimension or any imagined direct, including the imagined view of who I am in the world. And even if it, even if the imagined view reflects kind of who I am in the world, it's still in my imagination and there's still difficult is attached to it. The imagined view might be thinking about going over and punching my neighbor because he's going to drive on my daffodils again tomorrow. It's a fabricated view or viewing myself driving the Mas Maserati when I haven't actually picked it up yet. It's a fabricated view. It's a distraction. And as wonderful as it might be in this moment, I'm thinking a little bit about it. <laughs> it's a fab, isn't it? And, and it's obvious that now I'm out of my body, aren't I? It reminds me of a commercial that I saw once for uh, I think some kind of uh, convertible and they had Ray Charles driving this convertible on some wide open beach and the man is just laughing his head off. <laughs> <laughs> what was about? Yeah. Um, if I'm going to be fantasizing about vehicles, it better be a tank the way because I can't see. <laughs> if you see a tank coming, get out. <laughs> so if you see the tank missing on Route 12, it means, you know, I, has it. Yeah. it means I finally got what I wanted. The Buddha continues, this follower of the Noble Eightfold Path, having abandoned self-identification with form, having abandoned aversion, having abandoned self-reference now here and now there, they enter and remain in the perception of the infinitude. As he goes through all this, and I'm going to pass through that. And they recognize the five clinging aggregates as impermanent, stressful, a disease, painful, and affliction. And as such, they are not self. They disregard these phenomena and incline their mind to the cessation of ignorance. Nothing remains to provoke the birth of suffering. Um, gotten a little bit late. That, that's almost the end of the sutta, and that's the point to make. Nothing remains to provoke further suffering. So what is it that provokes suffering within us? What is it that provokes suffering within us? Michael, did you have your, it looked like you were about ready to answer. Taking everything personally? Yeah, well, what is that rooted in? Ignorance. Ignorance. And that, that brings us all the way back to what the Buddha awakened to, isn't it? It is from ignorance of four noble truths that all manner of confusion, delusion, and stress and suffering arises. So the solution isn't rituals and practices and chanting and um, abstract concept, concepts, no matter how wonderful, such as compassion or love or anything. The resolution to ignorance isn't one of those things. It's not endless bowing. According to the Buddha, it's not trying to appease or get a certain God to notice you. It's simply to clear up your thinking, to develop concentration and let go of any fabricated view. And it doesn't, and it, it, it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? You, I mean, the reason why I'm saying that is it, it doesn't have to make sense, but it does. And it's in the direction that is clear, isn't it? Even if the path itself isn't act, act, absolutely clear, the direction is wisdom. And how did the Buddha teach wisdom? Through an eightfold path. It's just that way. Thank you for listening. Um, let's go to Mary first. Mary, how are you this morning? Mary online. Morning, John. How are you? I'm good, thank you. 
Um, good morning. It's good to be there with everyone. This is a very nice sutta, as they all are. Um, I, I just made some notes because sometimes it's hard to go first. <laughs> so I had to make some notes while we were talking. Um, but through, through your practice of concentration, it allows you to keep the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, present when you're on your cushion and off your cushion, allowing you to uh, be free of the entanglement. You become aware of your defilements, your clinging aggregates when they're rising um, to return to the breath so they don't become um, a player in your life, if you will. Um, and, and concentration, it, it allows the detachment, but I guess I guess I like the word like disentanglement, you know, with the phenomenal world, because from that, um, it's not just stepping back and withdrawing and removing yourself from, from phenomenon. Instead, it's sort of a quietness of leaning into your life. And because of that concentration, loving kindness flows. Wow. That's beautiful, Mary. It's just a, a beautiful characterization of, of what occurs. The the, um, the 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 loving kindness simply is a is an is an aspect of being an awakened human being. It's not it's not even that's not fabricated. So thank you for that, Julia. You're welcome. Thank you. I, I did it. <laughs> thank you, Mary. <laughs> we we talked earlier how Julie's always always the last one. So. <laughs> Because I start here. <laughs> and then I'm always stressed out making you come here. But you know, so this is all about stress out. release. Yeah, now I can just go and be like, shh, <laughs> relax. Um, I enjoyed this um, the sutta very much. Um, but while I was reading it, it made me think of uh, this, of the, the simplicity of it and uh -huh. how it's very, it's actually very beautiful when, when you start thinking about it because you realize, well, we come into this, this world with the in breath. And we leave it with the ex the, yeah. the exhalation, and and you know you know that when you're just like as you said before, when you're stressed, mm -hmm. your breath goes quicker. Yeah. When when you're relaxed, your breath calms. And it's amazing that Buddha thought of such a simple, essential technique mm -hmm. to to become self-realized. That's that's yeah. the amazing thing about it to me. Yeah. I, I, I agree because it's it's part of every it's essential. Yeah. It's a part a part of every being, you know. So it's a symbol. Everyone comes with the same key. We all have it. it it's something yeah. that we're all blessed with. We have we have breath. And so this technique, it's you don't have to purchase it. You don't have to <laughs> chant for it. Like you said, we'll chant or buy techniques or advanced techniques because you already have all the keys Everything. within you. Yeah. And so um, it's 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 I I I just I'm just amazed by the simplicity of it and how it actually can. Uh, you know, influence your whole life. You yeah. know, make you by just practicing the jhana, you become deeper and deeper in the present moment, and then how you can carry that to your daily life yeah. and be, you know, shrouded in, you know, in this um, blissful state of just being and just peaceful stillness. You know. Yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah. So I, I thank you, John, for you know for bringing us the, the Buddha. Buddha's words, you know, it's very beautiful. Yeah. Thank, you. Well, thank you. Thank you for being here because I look pretty silly talking about this by myself. <laughs> um, I, I'd like to ask you a question, and you please, if you if you're uncomfortable about the answer at all, oh, no. just say. And I'm not going to mention the technique because then it will sound like I'm trying to put it down, and I'm not. No, 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 no. But do you do you notice, and you may not, that you're developing your concentration deeper with this method, or or not? Uh, yes, I do. Yeah, I did too. So it, yeah. it, it, in fact, it made that that made all the difference, and it really is a difference between something that is slightly abstract and something that is just this direct. I, sometimes I compare it myself because I, I it was a gift given to me by my parents, you know, mm. since I was, when I was twelve. Great, a, a great gift. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, yeah, because it, it's kind of like spirit me in life. Yeah. You know, meditation technique spirit me in life and made me be the person who I am today, and. You know, I thank them for that because sometimes the world the world is very complicated. Yeah. And I always had some a technique that actually, you know, 
could still be in and maybe be present. And so, um, but I do compare it a lot, a lot, a lot of times, and I realize that this is this is very simple, and everyone has has this technique within them. Yeah. So if you don't have to purchase it, it's it's there yeah. for you. You know, it's there. It's your gift. Yeah. And so, um, yes, and I find that it is. Um, it's 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 easier to do because well, it's it's natural. Right? You know, you don't have to say some foreign word or anything. It's it, yeah. it, it does. You do concentrate deeper. I feel. Yeah, I thank you. Uh, thanks for answering it. the The Buddha said that his his dhamma is good in the beginning, good in the middle, good in the middle, and good in the end. And that that it doesn't even what is what does he mean by that? He means good in the beginning means that it's easily accessible. Anybody can start it. Anybody can begin this this eightfold path. It's good in the middle because it 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 contains its own direction. In other words, it keeps you going if you actually start developing it and practicing as intended the Dhamma itself carries you through. And it's good in the end in that it actually has a culmination. It's not some abstract wish for ending. There's actually a practical experiential ending. Good in the beginning, good in the middle, good in the end. And I found that to be true, you know, which is not something that I had experienced and before. And you uh, had mentioned before about um, even like things that like advanced techniques and things like that, you have the techniques. The, the, yeah. the advanced technique is that you continue practicing it until become fully liberated that's that's yep. that's the advanced technique there's no there's nothing else and that's necessary you have you have it within you you know yeah there's it no, is there's no higher you know level but you already have it it's within you yeah we do it is and it, there's nothing the buddha taught that is not part of a human being mm -hmm. and again it makes absolutely what well, why and how could you teach something that's extra human it doesn't it doesn't make sense in this context it can't be done uh, thank you. Thank you, John. Um, yeah, yeah. Michael, it's gotten late. Uh, okay, I'll try that. No, I mean that to you. Should hurry up. I, mean, <laughs> I was just saying that to myself because I was. Yeah, we'll be done by noon today. So. <laughs> no, um, I think uh, Ram had said earlier about the quality of the truth is what works. Yeah. Right. But how do we discern the truth? Right. Yeah. So. Concentration to meditation, meditation, meditation absorption enables us to uh, to have deepened concentration. Yeah, right. It enables us to deepen in concentration, deepened concentration, or deepening concentration enables us to discern the truth. Yep. Moment by moment, as life unfolds, right. That truth. Uh, which is right view, right mindfulness, right intention, right concentration, right speech, right effort, right livelihood, right action is the Eightfold Path. So that happens moment by moment with deepening concentration and discernment of what the actual truth is. Yep. yep. By holding in mind that Eightfold Path, yes. Exactly. Yeah. But it comes actually with a deepening concentration through meditative absorption, it actually enables us to discern, uh, to us integrate the Eightfold Path as we move throughout an ever-changing life. Yes. And it happens like natural. Yes. Yes. It's, 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 um, you could say it's the most natural thing in the world because it is. Thinking, thinking clearly is the most now what what else could you describe as being more natural and thinking in a way that relax reflects the truth of human existence yeah, and, and that truth is always changing and that's why it, it's silly to put uh, i shouldn't use the word silly i don't mean it to it's in the context of the buddha's dhamma it's foolish to try and describe systems that are permanent any type of system especially a philosophical system as permanent because it there's nothing permanent any philosophical system has to be based in some way on what's occurring in the world. And if what's occurring in the world is always changing, how can it be? That's what the Buddha awakened to and said, dukkha occurs. It's, it's got nothing to do that, that, um, pick a God, you know, in <coughs> Avalokiteshvara is someone who's out there and is looking out for us. No, the, the, the reason why I'm suffering and confused right now is because I don't understand, period. That's the problem. And that's what the Buddha resolves. So thank you.
Karen, good to see you this morning again. Welcome back to our Sangha. Uh, so something that I did this week, I guess, um, uh, was discussed in this and, um, uh, and may, so maybe it wasn't the right thing for me to do this week. Uh-oh. <laughs> Uh, I, I was so um, enjoying the experience of meditating at home in a particular place where I had been doing that uh, when I had moments like uh, when my daughter was um, in a building doing something, I was waiting for her in a car, ah, I was meditating. Um, so um, perhaps uh, the Buddha is saying um, that, that it, it, it's better to go to that quiet no, 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 no. Without the parking lot. <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry. I gave you that I impression. Am I wrong? And, and no, you're absolutely action. right. No, the, the, uh, the Buddha never taught this, but, but I do it. Wherever you're meditating, you should be, wherever you are, you should be meditating. Driving. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't the, I'll uh, be here next week. <laughs> thank, thank, thank you for, for allowing me to clarify. Your formal meditation sessions, sits, should be on your cushion twice a day. And any other opportunity that you have to meditate, it's a good idea to do it. Okay. So you didn't, weren't doing anything wrong, not, not at all. Oh, okay. Yeah. The, the, the problem is that people can uh, uh, look at meditation as, uh, as opportunistic. In other words, okay, I'm, I'll meditate now because I know I got to wait for my daughter, wait for some, that'll be my meditation method. Okay. Or when I go to the doctor, I know I'm going to the doctor later. Right. So I'll meditate there. Sit on, get on your mm -hmm. seat when you get up and 12 hours later, and then when you get to the doctor's office, meditate for a few more minutes, you know? Okay. And so what a great point and thank you for bringing it up. Uh, and your meditation method is going well? I, it is. Yeah. It is. Uh, <clears throat> I am left with a, another a question. Sure. Um, I don't know, is this an- Absolutely. Moment of three? That's what question this is, is for. Okay, okay. Um, I, I'm wondering, in, in all these things you're explaining and I'm, I'm reading your book, I, it, it almost seems like it's uh, leading to celibacy. Wow, another good, good. Only, only if the Buddha never taught that as an aspect of awakening, you must be celibate. There's nothing that the Buddha taught that denies any aspect of being a human being. What he taught was that if you're going to be part of a, of a, Sangha, meaning the original Sangha, a committed um, group of people that have left the world behind are only going to be focused on the Dhamma. And you're going to be living as a community, meaning there's going to be men and women living as a community. Your focus in that community is awakening, not interpersonal relationships and not sex. And so he, and knowing that there was inherent difficulties in that, men and women were well, I guess you could, you could say, and any type of sex, even if it was homosexuality, was advised against simply because it's a human entanglement that doesn't, that is not the optimum way of developing awakening. So you join, you're joining the Buddhist Sangha and you're making commitment to saying the most important thing, the only thing I want to do in my life is to awaken. Let me come in and be with you. Those were the rules. But he also had rules like, um, you can't empty your chamber pot off a roof. See, no, that's that's in the Vinaya. <clears throat> Do not enter, and it's and it's and it carries as much weight as that one on on uh, celibacy. But you could see you can see a way where uh, where where you can fall in love with somebody and, and 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 yet not get caught up in that. Absolutely, there's a way. Oh, of course. Well, think about it. again. For, can is it possible to, to be in love with another human being and and not not need to own them? Well, it, it, it kind of answers itself, doesn't it? But yet, people rooted in a fabricated view own have to own everything that they're attached to. And, and using that word, of course, we don't we don't own another human being, but that's the relationship that we have. But we can also have that relationship with another human being that is peaceful, stress free, and always rooted in in dana in generosity by awakening and it doesn't take both folks by the way it's the clinging it's the clinging that and the clinging it's and the permanent. it's the craving and the clinging that destroys all relationships craving meaning i want this person to be different than they are 
or clinging that they stay the same that they are. Meaning, I want my wife to stay 20 years old forever. That's the I mean, really. I mean, and how many times do we hear <laughs> hear men? I mean, literally, they leave this person that they used to love simply because their appearance changed, and vice versa. It's not just men that do that. All of these are because they're rooted in fabrication. There wasn't, there was no initial connection anyway. So you ask, it's, it's a fundamental and basic point. We simply live better in the world, no matter what the situation is, whether we're, we've decided that we're not going to be in a relationship or we are. It's simply a more meaningful experience. And there's, there's nothing, there's nothing that the Buddha taught that, denies our hum humanity. Nothing. In fact, everything he taught, um, I don't want to say exaggerates it, encourages. That's, that's the right word. Everything the Buddha taught encourages us to be a human being. In fact, now that I'm saying it, I think it's the first thing I've ever come across that actually says, you're, you're it as a human being rather than you need to be something else as a human being. And I've never said that before. I don't know. I'm going to look at that yeah. because most systems, philosophical, spiritual, religious, political, <laughs> insist that you be a certain way. The Buddha said you can only be one way, and that's a human being. It's remarkable. Boy, th thank you, Karen. Barbara, welcome to our Sangha. Uh, how was your meditation and your well, experience? I really like your description of meditation because I came to meditation more through yoga practice. Uh -huh. And so there were often guided meditations and things you would think about and so on. And it was always like, you're getting in my way. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I really like this approach. Um, and then I wanted to ask you one other thing. Is sure. When I meditate, I almost always like, hear like a buzz or a, I don't know, like an energy or something. Mm -hmm. And it's always present when I get really quiet. So I'm wondering, do I have tinnitus or <laughs> yes. um, something oh, else? Well, yeah I, yeah, I can't diagnose that. But, um, you know, but I, if, if it continues, I would talk to Matt Branham is the mm -hmm. acupuncturist here. Mm -hmm. And he is really, if you don't know, do you know him? No, he, he's really, he's just an incredible human being, but he's great at what he does too. I would, I would get a session with him. But what I would say before that is to just continue with this meditation method and see if it's, because it, to me, it sounds like, um, call it background noise, but just a, a, um, a remnant of a, a less than well concentrated mind. And I'd be surprised if it didn't diminish, but maybe there's a physical component to it. Um, so there's my answer. I hope that's a helpful, helpful answer. Mm -hmm. It should, it should diminish. Um, if it doesn't, you know, let me see your doctor. I was, think about seeing that. Um, as far as um, beginning with this method, there's uh, on, on my website, becoming buddhacom at the top of the homepage there, you'll see guided meditations, I think it says, and there's uh, five to 45 minute guided meditations using the verbiage that I use here. That's the guidance. So you can download those and listen to it. Um, that I think you'll find helpful. And just remember that there's more to it than just meditation. I think I made the point today, I hope. <laughs> and that we're, we're here Tuesdays and Saturdays. So I hope you think about becoming part of our Sangha. We'd love to have you. Michael, welcome to our Sangha. Thank you. Thank you. This was my first experience in meditation. Yeah, so I really want to hear what you say. <laughs> so I was impressed with the simplicity of it. Um, of course, over that, so, and I found that during the first period, I was able to stay in focusing on my breath uh, well, and it was, and I kept, I went out and came back in many, many times during the full period, which I'm not surprised about. Um, we all did, right? Mm, oh, yeah. But, yeah. but it, so it was a struggle, but I, I, I was impressed by, and I liked the simplicity of it. I imagined um, meditation to be much more complex yeah. than this. Yeah. Than it's often taught that way. So then that was what I, I picked up somehow. So it's, it's a more attractive, I, the simplicity of it makes it a more attractive idea to me.
To me too. Thank you. And and yeah, if you just remember that one thing that meditation is, for one thing, it's not about developing a trance-like state. We you know that's that's the common misconception that meditation is about developing that trance slate or a blank slate or a situation where we're simply not aware of our thoughts. And again, that, there's nothing more cruel than that. We're, we're human beings. We need to be thinking in order to be human beings. The Buddha taught that the problem is not that we're thinking, it's that we're distracted by our thinking. Another way of saying is that we're enamored with our thinking. We so love our thoughts that we just, we can't not be distracted by it. And this simple method does the trick. So uh, again, um, thank you for joining our Sangha. I hope you both continue. And you, you can go on the website and, and download these. Uh, again, I suggest you meditate twice a day. Um, I meditate as soon as I get up in the morning, which is around five o'clock. And I'm naturally home, I'm actually usually home around five or 5.30. And so 12 hours later is when I meditate again. Uh, the point of that is it's better to meditate earlier in the evening than right before you go to bed. Most people decide, okay, I'll go to bed. I'll meditate just before you go to bed. It doesn't work as well. You want to get to sleep. So welcome. Good morning, David. I'm all set. Thank you for being here. Hello, Tim. Good morning, everybody. I'll talk fast because I'm kind of done. You don't have to. Um, so the, uh, look at jhana practice as the calisthenics hmm. of our mind. Yeah. Okay, so it keeps, and that's why uh, uh, having uh, that routine, uh, getting on your cushion twice a day, once a day, whenever you can, is important because it keeps it keeps that those wheels going all right so when you do leave your cushion and the one i did i did one of that conversation you can kind of take it with you um that seclusion um, and recognize when uh compact arises and 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 how we react uh guided mm -hmm. by the full path to those phenomena that are attacking us and you know i was thinking about this you know there's and I've said this when I first started coming here, I recognized very quickly that there's a choice. You know, we live in a very fast society. We live in a very materialistic society. I can go on and on. So when we leave the sanctuary of our cushion, we are bombarded by temptations of all these things. When you have a business or when you have employees students there it's all that's coming at you and so the best thing we can do is to keep that levelness that middle way mm -hmm. that right that stay on that path and react accordingly in the right view and right in the right way some people will like it some people will respond in a good way, but like I told, said in my last time I was here, you know, I've, I've lost friendships over it. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't lose it because <clears throat> it was not, there was, it was a fabrication. <clears throat> there were yeah. conditions attached to it. Okay. And, and that has to do with anything. I've noticed in business, by applying this, I am, I recognize when things happen and I, I basically, almost look at it as an entanglement, I, I, I get rid of it. Yeah. And so I may not be do business with somebody or that that creates that anxiety and stress that, that can come in. I'm not trying to go, go down a rabbit hole here, but I guess what I'm saying is that the jhana practice is key. Without without jhana, the jhana practice, we, we cannot we cannot develop Dhamma. Yeah. The sevenfold path won't get you there, right. you know, and a onefold path won't get you there. It's an eightfold path. Yeah. That um, and so you're describing the development of wise discernment with with the with the customer that you may not get entangled with. That's what that means. It's a practical application of of wisdom. This is just going to be a mess for me. I'm not going to do it. It's it's just why, that way. Why put yourself into a situation that's going to create or can create suffering? Now, the paradox that we've talked about is if we are well developed in the Dhamma practice, we should be able to do that and handle that. Well, yeah, and we should be comfortable with it. And again, we are, we are because we are mature. We understand it. There's, um, I've had family members and, and people that are a little bit more than friends um, get upset with me because I don't, be, because they feel I should be reacting more to things, to what they're bringing up. 
because and I understand that because they, when when someone's really caught up in something and you don't get caught up in it it brings a lot of fear up in that person because they feel isolated and so there's but be being able to be, remain mindfully present can sometimes help that situation, meaning just staying present and the person calms down. Sometimes you, like you said, you lose people. And I have, I've had people not want to deal with me because I, I, I cannot validate their own extreme <coughs> views and their own reaction, but that's just the way it is. But, and, but I'm able to maintain a calm and peaceful mind. And when the opportunity arises for me to be helpful, and it's not just, I see somebody who's completely stressed out, I'm gonna tell him the Dhamma, because a lot of times that's just ridiculous. It's, it's wrong speech because it will fall on deaf ears, but I'm able to stay present with someone, period. And that makes all the difference. A, a good therapist knows that. A good therapist, they're a good therapist, mainly because they can really be present with someone without bombarding with psychological theory all the time. And that's, that's just the way it is. And the same is true for us. As we develop, we talked a little bit about this, and we're going to more in the next few weeks, by the way. As Dharma practitioners, what does it mean to be out in the world? It simply means to not be an evangelist, but simply to be a, a quiet and gentle example of what you know to be true. And you're doing it. Well, congratulations. Good morning, Susan. Welcome to our Sangha. How was your meditation in your class? You don't have to say it was great. You can say it's a bunch of rubbish and I'll never come back. My, my, uh... I, I used to, I'm used to doing like stretches before I meditate, yeah. so my legs fell asleep. Oh, yeah, so, yeah. but I didn't realize it until after I woke up. I'm like, oh, my legs are numb. So, um, but something that you had said really um, resonated with me. I, what was her name? Julia. Julia. That Julia said, um, and I love it. It's something I read. At Rob Bell. He's like he's a weird like Christian, like whatever, whatever. Um, Christian food, you know, like whatever. Um, <laughs> label. Um, it's, it's something so beautiful, like that, um, the breath, you know, we're so hyper aware of like the first breath when a baby's born like that. Mm. And then the last breath when we die, but it's all those breaths in between and like just yeah. enjoying the, well, like just being present for that beauty of the breaths in between. And I, I love that. Yeah. I love that. <clears throat> that is. It reminded me of that, uh, the banquet. Mm. And then the concept of like, you know, we're kind of talking about this this week of like being, you know, super yourself or whatever that is, you know, like concentration on yourself. And you have like the world is like whirling around you, you know, all these things, the clients, the, you know, the this. And sometimes you can get wrapped up into it, right? You get just like wrapped up into the thought and then knowing that, oh, I could just come back to here, whether that's breath or self. Yeah. You know, like, of course, you're, we're human. You're, you're going to, you know, yeah. get distracted or get caught up. But you could always come back to the pivot point. I love that. Yeah. Wow. Thank you, Susan. That, the, another important point, the Dhamma is always there. In other words, no matter how far off you get from the path, just take a breath and you're back yeah. on it. Yeah. And then, of course, there's more to it. That's why we have... That's why our classes aren't just meditation. You know, they're, they're this, they're just this structure. We talk about the Buddha's Dhamma and we integrate the Eightfold Path as our, as our practice, not just meditation. So, um, if, again, welcome to our Sangha, all of you newcomers. And um, if you go on the website, becoming-buddha.com, uh, you'll see, if you scroll down, it'll pop up. And I think even if you hang around for a few minutes, uh, subscription to my newsletter. You can subscribe to that. And Mondays and Fridays, you'll get an email describing what the class is on Tuesdays and Saturdays and a link to it if you want to uh, read. Many of us read it first before we come here. Um, but you can do that. Uh, I hope you continue to join us. Future teacher Ram. <laughs> Ram and yeah, Jenner and teacher training. That's why I call you. Another that comes here to the jhanas, you know, we spar about what what I do and do not experience mm -hmm. in that. Yeah, I don't buy any of it. <clears throat> right. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm actually I'm starting to get a, a bit more established in my, my second meditation of the day. That's coming off the ground, so that's good. As in, I got I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you're a teacher now, so has it made a difference, that second sit? I think it's starting to make a difference. Um, 
And I'm, I'm also with, uh, especially the last uh, sessions on, on jhana and on, on fabrications, I'm starting to realize where this, <clears throat> uh, this difficulty in my, in my first and second jhana levels uh, hmm. sit in. That those uh, <clears throat> fabrications that keep coming up. Um, it, it's been something that I've um, been, um, it's been a big part of my, my daily experience is to, to live in this, in this kind of fantasy world. Uh, and I'm starting to realize the nature of that. Um, <clears throat> Where, uh, where Warner talks about sitting in meditation and seeing thoughts as kind of clouds you know, floating around. You know, I'm looking into a, into a pot of soup and <coughs> boiling <laughs> rapidly with a couple of dead rats floating around. <laughs> <laughs> Which is talk about a fabricated view. Yeah, that's a nice <laughs> And. Um, but I'm, I'm also, you know, I'm, I'm seeing how that that is uh, that is starting to evolve itself. Uh, but it's a it's a pretty strong experience. So um, I'm not now that I'm finally out of the, this fabricated view that I should not be thinking. Uh, I'm, I'm now becoming more familiar with with you know what's in the soup yeah. and uh, and how I can just let it go at some. Uh, but it's uh, yeah, it's a pretty strong soup. And, that, and you are letting it go. Yeah. You know? I, yeah. If yeah, someone I'm not, not disappointed or, or I'm happy with the way that the, the rest of the eightfold tap is working for me, I'm very happy with that. So that that keeps me going in meditation too. So it sounds like you're just not pleased with the remaining fabrications. Yeah. I just want some <laughs> well, the reason why I'm saying that <laughs> that's a personal view, isn't it? I yeah. Take... <laughs> um, Six years ago, if uh, <clears throat> brilliant, say I walked up to you on the street, you didn't know me, but being as brilliant as I am, mm -hmm. and I said, I know your problem. Your problem is fabrications. Mm -hmm. <laughs> would have meant nothing. Would have, the point that I'm making is that it, you have to understand what the Buddha's <laughs> Dhamma is to apply it. Right. And now you know how to, you know that this is where it resolves is is in this fabrications that are that reside within the individual, not out there. Thank you. Good morning, Lorna. Good morning. Just to follow on what Ron was saying, that I, I see more, more and more clearly that my pot of soup is, um, is, is just exactly that. It's my stuff. It's just yeah. a pot of soup that um, it's just all my stuff, which is the, the, the me that is just a fabrication in my head yeah. and and I, the the more you see that the less then you begin to the more you, the more you see the more you see that the more you see through it yeah the more you see through it see the fabrication in it the more you don't believe it mm -hmm. it kind of like and it, it kind of starts to melt away a bit the your own fabrication yeah. um so that's that's kind of how my um, how I think about that, my pot of soup. We all have pots of soup, and that's mine. Uh, and not, then, not quite clear chicken broth yet. No. <laughs> um, I think I'm going to make but, soup later. You know, right? <laughs> Just to speak about the soup this morning, it's probably one of the most inspirational Saturday mornings that I've ever spent in your mm -hmm. company. It's. Um, that's, that's quite the. Lauren's been coming for. <laughs> 20, 25 years. It crossed my mind that I don't know. It crossed my mind where I don't know why the, the Buddha didn't teach this sutta as uh, the first sutta that taught that set the wheel in motion. Uh, it's a good point because there wasn't any context for why do why to do it. Because this is the this yeah. is you know so anyway, but obviously it didn't. The Buddha got it wrong, obviously. <laughs> But no, this this sutra is, is so fundamental and heart of the matter and what it's all about and everything. I don't know why I didn't sort of teach this. <coughs> but anyway, 
So, uh, thank you. Boy, you really got me thinking. The reason, the, obviously, the Buddha didn't teach this sutta or any other sutta on jhana at first, even though it's fundamental, <coughs> be, because there was no context for it. Well, okay, I understand these different levels of jhana, but so what? Well, when you understand the context, it's because I understand I'm distracted by my own ignorance, so a concentration practice makes sense. You, you could, my, either one of my books, I think, contains a complete teaching of the Dhamma, but yet it doesn't, I mean, it's minuscule in comparison to what all the suttas the Buddha taught. You know, so, um, and the, the Buddha never taught any, any structured path, like we're doing a structured study right now. But, and I thought about this, why, why is that? Why didn't the Buddha just create a curriculum of the Dhamma? And it's because he was there. If you had something, if you had a question for an awakened human being, you just ask them. And that's where all the suttas flow from. Almost every one of them is situational, meaning it's a response to what's in, who's in front of him, the group or the individual. And sometimes it's about what he's recognizes going on in the song and then he'll address that. But that, that's the reason. So, yeah. Thank you. Good morning, Jen. Good morning. Um, I'm pretty distracted today. So, uh, another future teacher. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and there was like little bits of, of this sutta that I was pulling out and then going off into my head about and then coming back to focusing and then going back into my head about it and um it's interesting to to, to see that recognize it um and uh it, it makes sense because i my meditation practice has just kind of been all over the place lately and um you know that's what's happening um and what is what what i want to say about that is that this is a practice and you have to practice this one. And I yep. say that gently. I don't mean it in a, I'm not saying it in a, in a shame on you for not practicing way. I'm just saying you have to practice it. Just like if you learn to speak Spanish and then you don't yep. speak Spanish for 10 years, you are not going to speak Spanish as well. So if you don't practice, your meditation, if you don't practice bringing yourself back to your breath regularly, then regularly you will not bring yourself back to your breath. <laughs> <laughs> and I just think that it, the, the spear, the arrow, he's talking about practicing being mm -hmm. a good, was it an archer? Mm -hmm. See, I don't know, yeah. so distracted. Yeah. Um, practicing something. <laughs> is what you're doing here. You're practicing, yeah. you're choosing to practice to be concentrated. Yeah. And, um, and so, yeah, that's, that's just what my, what my experience was today. I want to share it. Thank you for sharing because that's so important. Um, and I know it's I, probably really hard for you to believe because I am a remarkable you, Dhamma practitioner. You are. You really are. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but you but you point out the you point out the impermanence of even a a um, a consistent and uh, well intentioned dhamma practice. It's, it sometimes feels that way, um, and even that is fabricated. What do you do? You come back to the practice. Um, but it is a practice. It has to be done. Now, th th this is the difficulty I think most people have that have come here and heard, heard this. Some people are inspired by it and some people don't want anything to do with it. And that's the way it is. But it's curious that it's not universally accepted. You would, uh, you would think that it would be, but why isn't it? Why don't people? And it's because you have to do something. Mm -hmm. And most people like the idea that all I have to do is to think a certain way. I get it. 
I just don't understand it. I, yeah, I grew up Roman <laughs> Catholic, and it was surprising to me how many people, I mean, I knew some of the people, I knew the, the how many people went to church on Sundays and were wonderful people and they were scoundrels on Mondays, you know, because it, because they were good to go. They did what their belief told them they had to do that. And now they'll be taken care of when they die. I mean, that's kind of where that focus is. Again, the Buddha realized the cruelty in that. It's got nothing to do with where I'm going. I can't take anything on faith just because I found a teacher that told me that I'm wonderful and, um, um, I'm going to be resting in the arms of my Lord forever, or that don't you understand that you're basically nothingness and emptiness and everything resolves in that, another form of annihilation? There's no practice in that. There's just, okay, right. I accept it, and I live my life from that standpoint. Or you can understand what it means to be a human being like you're doing, and sometimes you hit some rough spots. Okay. Um, do you think it might correlate to the beginning of the school year and you get super busy? Or is Oh, uh, yeah, it's the, it, yes, it's yeah. the beginning of the school year, and then also there's some uh, physical stuff that I'm dealing with that yeah. um, is, has sort of changed my routine a little bit, so, um, and it's just, just that way. Yeah. You come back to your breath. You came here this morning. Yep. So thank you. Um, it's gotten a little bit late. I apologize for that. I try to get my classes done in an hour and a half. Um, I don't always, but usually pretty close. Thank you. Uh, we'll hold in mind meta. And we always finish with meta, and we'll do that now. And uh, just a few, um, I just want to announce we have a, a, an annual dinner. Uh, our Sangha uh, gets together. Uh, we are this year. Uh, <laughs> December 12th, Thursday, uh, two weeks from Thanksgiving uh, at 7, 7 p.m. at Bamboo House. Uh, and you're all invited. Uh, you can bring family and friends if you want. Just let me know if you are. And again, if you want to get the newsletter and be apprised of all the stuff, just sign up on the website. So we'll finish with Metta, as we always do. And these are the Buddha's words on Metta from the Karaniya Metta Sutta. Uh, so again, find your relaxed meditation posture. Gently close your eyes, gently close your mouths, and take a moment to become mindful of the sensation of breathing in your body, your in-breath and your out-breath. And these are the Buddha's words on metta from the Karaniya Metta Sutta. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, tasteful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud or demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove. Wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings they may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another. Even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings. Radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will. Whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. By not holding to fixed views, the pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. Thank you all for a wonderful class this morning. Peace. See you, Mary. Bye, John. Have a wonderful weekend, everyone. See you next week. Bye-bye.